I'm sure a lot of people have seen this. This is just sort of the inflection of ML and AI um, in terms of uh, papers. Um, coming with that, you start to see more and more superhuman capabilities uh, for various things. So each line is a different area, um, handwritten, handwriting recognition, speech recognition, image recognition, et cetera, and then the year that it surpassed human performance. And I don't think there's any reason to assume that that won't happen for almost every aspect of human capability in the near term. And so this is a slide I used to show from 2017 to 2019, talking about the history of ML and deep neural networks and AlexNet and all these various things that happen. And honestly, much of this is now irrelevant because there have been two very big technology discontinuities that Mark alluded to. One is um, the diffusion models, which have really created these opportunities that we'll talk about in terms of how to act as a founder relative to image and video uh, and audio, actually, and then transformer-based models, uh, which is really changing how we think about language, chain of thought, and actual aspects of consciousness. Um, I, I was actually talking, I was doing a podcast with somebody, uh, Ilya from OpenAI, um, yesterday, and that'll go live in a week or two, and he was basically talking about how he thinks a transformer-based model may actually scale to all, all sorts of cognition over time as a general model, which I think is really interesting. Um, the striking thing to me is because we've had this big reset, this big technology discontinuity, it's not a straight line. We've had a big step up in capabilities. Um, the actual era of generative AI or modern AI is very short, and there's been very little startup activity, which means enormous opportunity for founders. So. Uh, if you think about it, the starting guns, in some sense, were stable diffusion mid-journey launching just a year ago or so, which is shocking if you think about how much has happened since then. And then ChatGPT didn't really come out until less than a year ago. And I think that's something that's really important to internalize. People weren't aware, most people weren't aware of how important this technology shift was until 11 months ago, because there was a neat chat interface on top of an API with a little bit of RLHF. And um, that means that if you're a big enterprise and you have a 64 month planning cycle, you haven't done anything yet, you've just talked about it. So all that impact of AI is coming in another 12, 24, 36 months as enterprises go from talking to prototyping to launching. And that actually creates two things. One is um, opportunities to founders to build things that enterprises will use as they adopt these technologies. And then the other thing is, um, it, it gives a window for founders to compete before there's gonna be a big change on the traditional enterprise side. So I think we have like a moment in time right now. Um, in terms of the differences of the capabilities, obviously you can now access the world's best models via API, when before you had to start dealing with ML ops and all sorts of other things like that. It's generalizable in terms of these models, there's chain of thought, uh, natural language understanding, and obviously new things are coming soon like multimodality and you know, you see also that these models encompass a lot of the world's knowledge and information since they're basically trained on the internet in a very deep way. And this is just from the GPT-4 um, paper where they showed performance relative to standardized tests of various types. So that means that as you're building in this market, as a founder, you can start actually using knowledge bases that exist on the web. And so things like Harvey, for example, which is a legal AI tool, um, can use GPT-4, and there's a lot of inherent knowledge that they can then supplement, but there's, there's enough legal baseline that you can start doing really interesting things. And you see similar things with, with Google's MedPalm too. And so if you look at AI adoption curves, I think we've gone through wave one, which is the AI native companies, open AI, mid-journey character, et cetera. We're currently in wave two, which is the next wave of startups adopting it, plus some very fast-moving mid-market um, companies like Notion and Zapier. But again, wave three and four are still to come. And I think wave four, which is again 24, 36 months in the future, is real enterprise adoption. And wave three is the startup wave of the new set of startups that hopefully you all are starting and, and helping form. Um, so how to build for AI. Uh, first, just like you build for anything else, start with a singular use case. Delight a small number of people um, and make it so that if you're gone, people actually miss your product. And so often when I talk to AI founders, they have these very broad-based things that they want to build. I want to build an AI assistant that will do everything for you. And you're like, okay, well, what does everything do? They're like, it'll make you happy. <laughs> like, I'd like to be happy, what does that mean? And they'll say, well, you know, it'll play music for you in the morning that you like, and then it'll tell your schedule, and then it'll do these five other things. And you're like, that's, that's a product that doesn't actually do any specific thing. You're kind of just, you know, saying it'll do everything for you, and usually that means it does nothing very well. And that's very different from saying, okay, I'm gonna choose the one singular use case initially that you know you go and you ask a bunch of people with EAs what do their EAs do, and then really target into those specific use cases versus just trying to do something very, very broad. Um, second, move fast and cheap. No GPU before product market fit. 
Um, I stole that saying, I think it's from Stan from Dust, who's the originator of it. And basically what that means is that um, what you've seen in the past year or so, or maybe 18 months, is a lot of AI companies going and raising um, $20 million, $50 million up front to train a model versus just prototyping a use case and seeing if actually anybody cares and then training a model once you actually know that people want to buy the product from it, right? And so people kind of sneeringly talk about GPT-4 wrappers or GPT wrappers, but I think actually that's a great place to start. Start with a cheap, quick, easy approach and then iterate from there, particularly if you're doing something that's natural language focused. If you're doing diffusion models, which are much cheaper to train, you know, half a million dollars or a few million dollars on the high end, maybe you can go ahead and just do that for image, gen, or video related products because it's actually cheaper to train and you can iterate on it faster. Um, and then for both, I think the key is to just move fast and be capital efficient. And the other thing that people misestimate when they start thinking about training models is you need to have to bring on specialized people to do that. And so just the recruiting and everything else also adds time and craft. So I think no GPU before product market fit is a very good AI-specific builder thing. Um, third is to focus on uh, low-hanging fruit and the easy stuff. So early in a market, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that's just obvious to go do. You should just go do that. And people tend to overthink it. And they want to do these very complex, advanced, hard things with complex business models and specialized weird things associated with them. And you know, if this was very late in the market cycle, that's what you should go do. But it's very early in the market cycle, which means you have to find the sort of forest gump things. What are the really dead simple, life is a box of chocolate kind of opportunities versus the really complicated ones? Uh, fourth is uh, don't overthink early defensibility. This happened in SaaS too. If you think about it, many of the SaaS companies that became very important in the most recent era were two engineers working for six months before they launched a product. What's defensible about that? Most SaaS companies have no defensibility. And there was an era where everybody said, well, none of these companies are defensible, and then you have these massive SaaS companies. Well, and of course there are defensible companies as well, right? Um, but if the thing isn't defensible early on, that's fine as long as we have a path towards defensibility. And I think people really overthink, um, similarly, AI companies not having any defensibility because it's just using GPT-4. And really, it's to building out a broader workflow and use case, and I think Mark's point is a really good one. If you have to replace the workflow, then you can actually build defensibility through that workflow. And then there's other ways to build defensibility, um, and of course, you always want to watch out for incumbents. And so the, uh, there's sort of like six or seven standard ways that people think about defensibility for almost every business model, and many of these things are also just going to apply equally well to AI companies. And so as you build out your AI company over time, you need a network effect or a scale effect or a platform that other people build against and integrate with that increases the value of it. Um, there may be moats on the business side. There may be IP if you're doing something in biotech, but in general, I think you can really think deeply about the defensibility of the business. Um, but I wouldn't overthink it. I would just go and build and find people who care about what you're doing. That's usually much harder than anything else. And then the last point is just go for it. Don't overthink it. Um, you know, obviously some people are constrained because of visa issues, financial issues, et cetera. If you don't have those constraints, there are gonna be a few moments in your time when you don't have a lot of constraints in life. And so there's enormous opportunity cost in not trying it. Um, I think that what I found is that people who just go and start something versus constantly dabble on the side tend to do better simply because all your time and effort is focused on something versus just partial time. And you need to remember this is truly a unique moment in time. There have been very few moments in my life where there's been this massive of a technology shift. And this is a fundamental change. And again, it's not, hey, we have an ML and it just kept getting better. We had a technology discontinuity that has created fundamental new capabilities. And so now is a moment in time to go start something and capitalize on that. So that's all I got. I really appreciate the time today. Thank you.